Chris here from Science of Diagnostics. Uh, we're going to try something a little different here. We're going to be talking about uh, hydraulic testing techniques and how we can modernize them with the technology we have available. So anybody who's familiar with hydraulic testing knows it's not fun. It's messy, it's dirty, you may as well be wearing a pair of these all the time because you just get completely and totally covered. You're constantly disconnecting fittings, reconnecting, trying to find adapters, oil everywhere, trying not to get dirt and debris into it, if you can even get to the fitting you need to, to plumb your gauges in. And gauge-wise, I mean, you've got, you know, old school cobbled together for a case drain, which is low pressure. You've got larger analog gauges here, quick coupler, system pressure, deadhead, that's fine. You even have up to the modern day, uh, the Parker digital gauges, pressure transducers. To start, what was nice about analog is you could see the fluctuations. If there was a valve bouncing, something like that, you could see it in the, ga in the gauge vibration. Digital like this, all you see is a number reading. But we're all becoming increasingly familiar with these pressure transducers. And this is where I'd like to go. <clears throat> now, a couple quick things we want to go over here is the fact that, number one, hydraulic systems follow some basic rules. One, fluid is virtually incompressible. And two, if uh, hydraulic fluid is in a tube, hopefully you can see that, it acts equally in all directions. Alright? So no matter where it is, whatever container it's in, it could be a, a square, a circle, whatever, it's going to act equally and at right angles to all surfaces. So it's uniform. The pressure is uniform throughout. Now, much like an internal combustion engine, a hydraulic pump has fluid pulsations. So for every rotation, of a pump, you'll have a little spike and a little valley. So you'll have your pressure and then you'll have your suction. So, with each one of these pressure and suction pulses, very similar to an in-cylinder waveform, you'll actually have, say your, uh, this is your metal tube or whatever, you'll have, actually have pulsations of that tubing coming in, uh, general idea there, in, but it's also going to be going in and out, in and out. That tubing is going to move, tubing, hose, whatever, is going to have fluctuations. Now hydraulic systems are inherently designed to minimize that, so you don't hear any noise, you don't hear any whining, hissing, uh, lines banging together, whatever else. But we know anytime there's a pumping action, the fluid is going to react accordingly. Now you have your uh, stretching colors here. You're going to have your gear pumps. And gear pumps are just literally two, two gears that mesh together and are constantly pumping. So these are the least amount of pulses. But they're not commonly, well, they're somewhat commonly used in lower call systems, but either way. Then you have your vein pumps, which will put out some more pulsations, but not, not a ton. And these are self-adjusting for wear. And then you have your uh, rotary piston pump. Now with the rotary piston pump, What you have is basically a, a, a tiny little internal combustion engine almost. You have a cylinder barrel like this, and then you have little spring-loaded pistons all around it. And then you've got your drive mechanism in the center. So as this goes through, every time one of these pistons moves up some up and down, it creates a pumping action, just like a piston in an internal combustion engine. So, we know that because the fluid pressure 
is equalized throughout the system, it acts in all directions equally, and that any movement in a closed system will transmit throughout the system, much like electricity or air in a cylinder. Every time this pumps, we'll see a slight pulsation. Now, on your regular digital gauge, or even on your analog gauge, you are not going to see this. This is, if we're talking a 4,000 PSI system, it may be a 200 PSI fluctuation, which in the grand scheme of things is nothing. So how, how do we look at it? I mean, it, it's a nice theory, but is it any good? Well, yes and no. There's much like anything else, and see if we can get you focused in on this. And these were taken from a diagnostic network, uh, courtesy of Ben Martins, where Ben actually used a Pico, Picoscope, oh, let's try this side, maybe, Picoscope with a pressure transducer to plot out pressure and flow of a hydraulic system. So now we're graphing it. Now we don't just have our standard gauge movement. We're going further pretty cool, but still, you know, we can see pressure fluctuations, we can see how as pressure increases, flow may decrease, I forget all the scaling on this, this is just uh, for brief illustration purposes, but then if we go over to another capture, where we're actually zoomed in on our red, so uh, red was a secondary hydraulic pump, green was a primary hydraulic pump, once again a diagnostic network, Ben Martins from Pico, but if we zoom in here, we can see the pressure pulsations we were talking about, and let me see if I can get you guys, uh, actually it doesn't look too bad from your side, but each one of these is our piston movement, just like an in-cylinder pressure transducer waveform, we can see these same waveforms zoomed in, so each one of these, um, we'll say a standard pump, we'll, we'll go fuel pump style, uh, we'll say there's eight pistons within that cylinder block. So there's, there's a couple ways we can do it. I mean, this is a nice uniform repeating pattern. The secondary pattern here, the secondary pump, is not quite as defined. But we could use an RPM trigger. We could use, um, you know, a photo tack something to designate. Or if we knew how many pistons were in the barrel, we could then figure out pump speed uh, if a certain certain pump or slipper within the pump was failing all by looking at one gauge reading directly at the pump. So that's cool, but where are our variables? We'll get to that in a minute.